think about holding you and you was crying, just being in a cold world. I remember just looking at you like, you are the most beautiful person I ever saw. Like thanking God that he trusted me with this creation. And when I was looking to your eyes, you don't know anything. All you see is a bunch of strange people, but in my eyes, I'm thinking, I gotta protect you. I wanna be the first to call you beautiful. I wanna be right there when you have your first knee scrape. I wanna be right there when you need a shoulder to cry on. I wanna be right there to, you know, to wipe the tears off your face. I think it was between six and seven. Um, I, were, I moved in with my grandmother. Uh, she was an amazing woman. I mean, she would wear suits just to go to the corner store and raise six kids, you know, on her own and with help, of course. But um, I moved in with her because of the situation with my parents. Um, and things, you know, got a little bit crazy. So um, it, it took me a while to kind of like realize everything that happened. Honestly, I was like 15 when I went to um, this, the, a movie theater with my father. And we watched this movie called The Butterfly Effect. And so in this particular scene of The Butterfly Effect, there's um, this girl and this boy. And this the guy, the storyline is always going back to try to make this girl's life better. But in this particular scene, you have a family member and they're um, recording them doing things to each other. And so at that moment, I had like this memory recall where like I remember being um, in a living room and there was this guy um, and uh, my best friend at the time and I was living with my grandmother and he would have us like take off our clothes but it was always like a game so he would tell us to take off our clothes and do this and do that to each other and like do this kind of stuff with our underwear and remove this kind of stuff um, but I immediately just dismissed that thought um, and it wasn't until I had hit this really like horrible point in my life. Um, I had always grown up in church, but I've all, I had always been tossed back and forth um, between family members. But um, about three years ago, I um, was in a relationship and I ended up getting pregnant. And um, I was so surprised that like after I had gotten pregnant that the person that I, you know, had kind of like made this arrangement with to, you know, get pregnant, had decided that he wanted me to terminate the pregnancy. So um, when I terminated the pregnancy, I had mourned for days and days. And I remember like looking in the mirror and I was like, I don't even know who I am anymore. Like, who am I? Because everything that I had grown up knowing, I had like completely gone against. And so I started to ask, well, I started to go to church um, and I started to really study the word and then I started to ask God to like help me deal with some of the stuff that I had gone through. I felt like little by little, um, he just started to kind of help me deal with some things and I had like all these journals that I had collected throughout my life and I started to kind of go back and forth between them. So, um, different memories started to happen. So during the time that I was living with my grandmother when I was like between the ages of five and nine. I, um, they had like this, this guy who would do maintenance around the neighborhood and he would just do it everywhere. Right. And so, um, at the time I went, I was a part of a religion where you could only wear skirts. So I remember, I started to remember that he would have us in, um, he would have me, it would just be me and him and we would go to different apartments to kind of fix things. But he would, you know, have me do things that would make him, um, like look under my skirt and just like touch me in inappropriate ways and I never thought it was wrong because I'd never learned the boundaries between this is okay this is not okay this is healthy touching this is not um so that was, that was one of the things on top of the child pornography thing that started to like happen in my mind and it was the craziest thing ever because it just all hit me like a flood and I didn't know what to do and I just kept reading through journals I remember that we had this neighbor that lived next to us and he um, was an older guy and everything, it turned into a game with him too. It was a game, let's play this game. You do this to me, you do that to me. And it was really inappropriate. And I remember one time he had 
had me do these things to him and he went to the bathroom and I'm assuming it was to finish himself off and I looked and there was this notebook paper behind his door and you could tell that he had just written it because there was papers on his table and so I started tracing the words that he had written and I remember him coming out of the bathroom and he's like asking me what I'm doing and by that point I had already made it to the bottom so I didn't know at the time um, that it was a prayer so I think that he had read exactly what I had written because it was there and I was really just tracing it out and nothing after that point had ever happened again um, but then there were still moments so I remember one time I was playing hide and it was like a hide and seek game with someone that was very close to me and a friend of theirs and um, we knew the neighborhood and everybody was very close so I remember we had gone to the back of this house and it was a game and then it became a truth or dare game right and so in the truth or dare game it was actually the guy who did the maintenance uh, job like son the other person he had told me to take my clothes off um, and that day was the first time that I was raped So for me, it was a game. So it didn't it didn't feel like it was the wrong thing because it was a game and nobody taught me what was healthy touching and what wasn't. And um, I remember that he had also dared that other person, another person to do the same thing. And they didn't want to do it. So that one person watched while the other person, you know, while we did the dare. I remember later on that afternoon, I was in the house. And now, you know, he had to fulfill the part of the dare that he said he would do later. And so that same day the same game happened for the second time in one day and all these memories just started to kind of like flood and hit me and hit me and hit me and I I was just like trying to figure out like how do you sort through all this stuff and be saved and still love people and love God um, and a process just began Initially when I started to process this stuff like I was really mad. I was just like you guys are supposed to be there Like you're supposed to be my mom. You're supposed to protect me. You're supposed to be my dad. You're my hero You're supposed to be there all the time and um, My parents were they were addicts. They they were you know My dad was in the same neighborhood that all this stuff had happened, but he was an addict and my mom you know, was in another part of the city, but she was an, also an addict. And so, like, even when I tried to be angry, you know, at the time where I started to process all this stuff, I had to, like, think about the fact that they had their own things that they had in process, and now they were using other ways to kind of cope. Um, and my grandmother was older, so it's like, you know, how do you really keep up with a, you know, six to nine-year-old um, at a time where they're the most active and you don't even consider or think that something like this would happen let alone that somebody wouldn't say anything because most of the time when most of these things were happening they would say don't tell you're gonna be in trouble for being here this late don't tell you're gonna be in trouble for playing this way so I thought that if I told I would be in trouble because I was doing something wrong so I never even shared How any of it I was between six and nine at the time. So that's why they always said it was a game. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I didn't know any better. Like, it wasn't like, you know, you have a sex talk between six and nine. So it was always just a game, a game that I only played with certain people, but I didn't play with other people. Or, I don't know. It was tough. So you would think that growing up in the church, you know, when I finally got pregnant and ran away from home, everybody was like, how could she do this? You know, she's been brought up in church. She knows God. She knows all these things. But what about the fact that it actually happened in the church? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What about the fact that my place where I was supposed to be safe at, even in my older ages from 12 or from 11 to like 13, I was at a church. And I would stay after because that was the place where I was safest. And, you know, you have people who are in charge of watching and leading and guiding innocent children 
who also decide that like sticking their hands in your pants is an okay thing to do. So nobody understood and that's I think that's what bothers me the most that everybody paid attention to my behavior. Why did she run away from home? Why is she pregnant? You know, she grew up, you know, in this family and the thing is that nobody bothered to ask me. Had somebody asked me what had been going on in my childhood, in my past and, you know, kind of walked me through my teenage rebellious behavior you would have realized that maybe I was promiscuous because I wanted to be loved maybe I was promiscuous because I wanted to be in control of something when at some point I didn't have the I didn't I wasn't able to give somebody the permission to do that like that's an intimate thing for you to do but somebody took that from you so nobody ever thought about considering that kind of stuff so you're saying that sometimes promiscuity isn't just because someone wants to go into the act, it's it's a control mechanism. No, honestly, like honestly, honestly, I I don't think that I've ever been intimate with someone and really engaged with them in a way that intimacy intimacy is supposed to be. It was always uh, my parents abandoned me, and so if I can be in this moment with with you and I can own it and I can keep it and I can feel like for one moment or one second, you're not gonna leave me, reject me, abandon me or take something from me that I didn't give you, then I would do that. And I'm not saying that that's always the case, but I know that for the most part with me, it was more about feeling loved, about feeling like I was in control, feeling like I was giving you something and you weren't just taking it away from me. But no one bothered to ask. Nobody bothered to ask and it was only when I really decided to spend time with God and ask him like to help me unpack all this stuff that I started to think to myself like maybe I really didn't like this person this much maybe I shouldn't have dealt with this maybe this shouldn't have happened but I feel like it all came from the back of me trying to like let go and heal and try to kind of cure the sickness that I had already had like attached to me like from a very young age who was the first person to ask you? nobody <laughs> nobody was the first person to ask honestly nobody was the first person to ask and this is probably why I'm doing this because nobody asked like nobody and I went to therapists I went to churches and everybody always focused on the behavior like Nobody stopped to think that, like everybody knew that my parents were addicts, but nobody stopped to think deeper than that, you know? And it, it wasn't until like I really started to spend time with God and just say, I don't want to be this way anymore. Like I didn't want, I didn't want my kids to go through that kind of stuff. It was horrible at times because nobody got it. And I was afraid to share. You know, because another thing that started to play in my mind was this just happened to me a few times and I played back. So maybe I wanted it to happen, you know, maybe I wanted it to happen because I could have stopped going to the house. I could have not been around the people who did it, could you? you know, I couldn't have. But in my mind, that's what it was like. This is what I wanted or you know like even at church this happened so if I'm supposed to be safe and it happened there like it has to be me it can't be everybody else and I just didn't want it and it just kept happening so nobody asked if they really knew what you've been through they probably stop and think if they really knew what you've been through they probably want to compare you to garbage and say your attitude stink if they really knew what you've been through, they probably wouldn't see you roll their eyes and stump their feet. If they really knew what you've been through, they'd probably see you smile and speak. They wouldn't prejudge you, they'd hug you and understand you just another rose that rose from the concrete. Well, I'm just saying, don't use what you've been through as a tool to get famous. Use what you've been through as a tool to let people know that you can make it. Use what you've been through as a tool to let people know there's a God up there that'll never leave you forsaken. To let them know that when you go through the process, things happen instantly. Just have a little patience. So what's next? It's like you're breathing on your last breath. You fret because life threats got you depressed. 
But realize that you bless, you alive in your mess. Christ died for your stress, so you rise over death. So you open, you focus, then you know where you're going. You're growing and growing, and folks start to take notice. Something inside, you don't know that you show them they want what you have. They want to move forward. Just think for a moment. You wake up in the morning. You just woke up. So stop the morning, you... We're chosen before birth to shake this whole earth, expose the folks hurt, and show them the Lord's verse. That's John 3.3. 3. That's straight to the point. But John 3.16, it backs up the point. So say to the top with the loudest voice, and I'll meet you up there. We at all rejoice. Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27 says, but if in an open country, a man meets a young woman who is betrothed and the man seizes her and lies with her, then only the man who lays with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. She has committed no offense punishable by death. For this case is like a man who attacks and murders his neighbors because he met her in an open country and though the betrothed young woman cried for help, there was no one there to rescue her. And so when I first read this scripture, before the Lord began to deal with me, I was just like, kill them all, Lord. Like they deserve to die, just kill them all. Um, but the thing about this scripture is that it's in the Old Testament and the New Testament where Jesus dies for us, everything kind of changes. And so I did this document here because I just really wanted everybody to know that there are steps and processes that you need to do in order to get somewhere. And during the documentary, I said a lot of times no one understood me or no one was able to ask. But along the way, as I began to pray and ask God to help me when I had reached this place where I could no longer move forward, he, began, he sent someone in my direction that would sit down and just ask me why. And there, I was able to take new steps um, to go into new directions where the Lord really helped me. And so I'm just doing this documentary so that people can know that there is another side I am happy I go to church I rejoice I smile more than I ever have and you see the pictures all the way at the beginning I'm like <laughs> and I'm just so sad but now I'm truly happy and this is something that's obtainable by anyone who's ever gone through something like this I also want you guys to know that 
I know that it's not only women who get raped. I know that men are raped too. And for you guys, the difference is that now your sexuality is questioned and um, people will call you less of a man if you say that you're raped because as a man, it's encouraged for you guys to you know, engage in sexual activity. And even if you're too young, you know, reaching out and saying this happened to you makes you look like someone who is weak. And so I just want you guys to know that happiness is definitely obtainable. And the first step is just to really be committed and allowing God to really help you work to, through these things. Um, and I can match that up with scripture because as you confess it, the Lord will begin to heal because in the word it says, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the words, the words of our testimony. So just testify, find somebody that you can trust and begin to unpack everything that you've gone through because like me, you can be set free.